Gerald Rock, United States Army, World War II. Gerald served with the 115th RCT, 5th Division, and was in the first wave that landed at Omaha Beach on June 6, 1944. Gerald also fought at the Battle of the Bulge in December of 44, January of 1945, and went on to help liberate the Dachau concentration camp, which was even worse than combat, he said. I interviewed Gerald in Holiday, Utah back in March of 2004, March 27, 2004. And him and his wife Dorothy and I, we all became friends. Gerald has passed away. He passed away in 2007. His wife just recently passed away in 2020. But their memories are vivid in my mind and I'm proud to share his story with you. And, and I'd like to give a special thank you to Anders Thorin in Denmark for sponsoring this story and making this possible. Anders, I salute you, sir. Thank you for helping tell Gerald's story and so the world can see it. If you would like to help sponsor one of these many stories, please contact me. There's information in the description underneath this video. So I'm proud now to present to you my interview, my complete interview with Gerald Rock in 2004. Thank you for watching. God bless you. or whatever during, during Well, right now, uh, right at that time, I was a private mm -hmm. with 115th RCT, the 5th uh, Division, under Guru, I think it was. Anyway, uh, uh, that was just about all you want there, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, now what I want to do is just go back in your mind. I know it's been 60 years, but what I, what I really want to do is there's, just, there's specific questions I'm going to ask you. Mm -hmm. And what I want you to first tell me about is what you can remember about the night before the landing, where you were, you know, what you were feeling, the mood of you and the other men, the emotions, and, and as you begin to, to go into the beach. But just start with the night before and maybe when they told you that this is it, we're going. And, uh, you know, just something along those lines, how you're feeling towards everything, what was going on. Okay. Well, we were, we came down from central England into, in and around uh, Poole. Uh, and it was, they kept us under pretty good guard. Wouldn't let us anywhere near getting out because maybe we would tip something that, that they didn't want to want to know out. So that night, uh, we had a pretty good dinner. Uh, really too much. And later, later on, they told us we were going to board ship. Didn't tell us where, didn't tell us a thing. So we boarded a, a, a ship, I think it was kind of like a, a you know, a cargo ship, not a, something like that anyway. And that morning, uh, or that night, when we boarded that ship, we started out and then they called us back for some reason. We didn't know. So then we did leave, finally left, and we went out at about, oh, I guess we were seven or eight miles, seven miles from, from Omaha Beach. And we anchored down, and uh, I can remember very vividly going down that rope ladder. That was, that was something. 
And we got down onto the LCT and, oh boy, it was bouncing up and down, up and down. And we had a heck of a time boarding that doggone thing, but we did. We finally made it. And then we went out and rendezvoused out away from the ship until other troops got in and got into their LCTs. And finally we all lined up and they started off toward the beach and it was so rough. And being in a flat bottom boat, it really got rough. So the majority of the, of the kids, the soldiers on, on board, got really, really sick. Oh boy. And threw up. I did too. And we threw up and threw up. But we didn't have any of those bags that you could throw up in. And, and we kept trying to see over the, the doggone thing, but we couldn't see over. All you could just see is just over the, the top of the, the landing craft. So we got in uh, quite a ways, but we could hear the shells and the machine guns, and uh, it, was, it was kind of frightening. But we were so cold, so sick, and it was kind of foggy that morning with rain and um, uh, anyway, uh, you some I think sometimes we just wanted to get off of the boat, and finally he you could hear the engine slowing down, and we were oh. We were fairly winning. We had a good, uh, I think that we too got mixed up somewhere. We, d we don't know what happened or where we got mixed up. But we docked in away from where dog company should have been. And uh, Anyway, uh, he got in and slowed down, and he finally stopped. And he was in uh, in an area we had bypassed two or three of those um, obstacles that they had out in the in the water. And he dropped the front and says, "Unload." <laughs> so we started out and sick. We were sick. But when you hit that cold water, you sobered up pretty doggone fast. And we started in, and I we hadn't stepped off much off of the ramps when three of our fellow soldiers were were killed, and they just kind of sunk. I think the weight of the packs and the ammunition and stuff we were carrying sunk them, and they just kind of disappeared because the water was muddy. Um, so we started in and it was so difficult to walk and that wind behind is pushing us. I can remember that. Uh, pushing us forward to where you wanted to stumble. You, my legs wouldn't go fast enough. So anyway, we, we got to the beach and on the way in, we lost, we lost a number of people, or a number, number of soldiers. And Sergeant Halls was somebody I really, really cared for. And we got onto the beach, but gee whiz, you kind of got scared whether you should stand up or lay down. You didn't know what to do. Soldiers were everywhere. Uh, I think some of the crafts beat us in. We didn't, uh, um, anyway, we uh, got onto the beach and we weren't more than uh, 15 steps and we were running. 
uh, all of a sudden, I heard this terrible expo explosion. And there were six of us in behind our sergeant, and it knocked us backwards onto the ground. And Halls was... So he was laying there and just kind of moaning. And we crawled up to him and we saw he had lost his leg. And the other leg was so shattered and we didn't notice the bottom part of his, what did I call it, Mom? Uh, lower extremities. Huh? Lower extremities. Oh, the lower extremities uh, were, were gone. And uh, so we grabbed a hold of him, another soldier and I grabbed a hold of his shoulder and pulled him up to the high water mark where we thought we could get some kind of protection from the machine guns and mortars. Uh, and I remember we opened up our uh, powder bags. Um, what in the heck was it? Um, it was before penicillin came out. Sulfa. Sulfa. And we put that on his leg that was shot off up on the stump, on the other leg that was badly torn up. And, ah, geez. He, he said to me, have I lost a leg? And I, I couldn't lie to him. And I said, yeah, you have. And he said, that's what he had, was talking to me in my ear. And I said, yes, you have. And he says, you know, I don't want to die without my leg. <laughs> I would have gone through, I'd have gone through hell to get back to. So I did crawl back. And the leg was, oh, several feet from where, where the explosion was. But I did get the leg, and I crawled back, dragging that, that leg. And he said, the time I got back, he had passed away. But I did put his leg there and we we sat there because every time you moved there was machine gun fire mortar rounds it was just it was so hectic that you you didn't know which way to turn so I didn't want to leave Sergeant Halt so I laid down beside him and I thought maybe if, you know, if a person moved on the beach as he wounded and moved, they redone it again. They had run those machine guns right back over you. And we I don't know how long I laid there with him. There was nothing else we could do. So, Uh, later, later on in the cruisers come up out and right along, well, they, they must have been out quite a ways from the, uh, the, the steel membranes that came out. And these light cruisers came down and around and then they started with their heavier guns hitting the, those um, pillboxes upon the bluff. And even down below, they were lobbing them in. And from what I understand, uh, 
the Navy, when they first bombarded and trying to knock out the guns, they knew they were there. But they were shooting over behind the, um, the pillboxes. Well, anyway, they did a tremendous job of just absolutely tearing those damn things apart. And Jesus, there were waves still trying to come in, but the beach was so cluttered that um, we knew we had to get off that damn beach. So we, we, all the soldiers on this side, we kind of just, after the guns had silenced up on the bluff, we moved around and started up the gullies and the little hills. And we ran into some fire, but it was getting late in the afternoon. And it took us time. We'd run into some rifle and machine gun fire when we were going up through those gullies and stuff. And then we finally reached the top and we went inwards. It was about 50, 60 of us, I guess. And we moved in behind to where we thought that it would be a safe area. And we just kind of rested. It was getting evening. And, and we didn't, we were so tired. And our sickness, we weren't sick anymore. We were just frightened. I mean frightened. Hell, just 19 years old, you, you, you wonder sometimes, you know, you're, you're, when you're young, you, you'll do, you'll take on more things than a man that's 10 or 15 years older than you. And we thought it was just a, a big game to begin with. But anyway, we got back in there and we, we rested and uh, early, early, and just as it was kind of breaking daylight, a whole group of soldiers come in from our left, and the, uh, there was a captain and a lieutenant and a signia, is that call a name to you, Signia? Uh, well, it was kind of, I would say, kind of southwest of where we were up on the top. And we were headed down to this town that was just where the perimeter, where we should have been. And that's where we headed to there. Let me, now, let me back up a little bit. Um, the night before, you're getting ready for the landing, you're getting ready to go, you're preparing all that. And as you get into the, you went in an LCT, it wasn't a Higgins boat, it was an LCT. No, 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 okay, no. So you went in, I mean, what was the mood of the other guys? Where You, you mentioned that it was kind of like a game. I mean, was it light? Was it serious? Was Did you have a prayer service or was there a chapel? Oh, yeah, we had a. Then tell me about that. We had a prayer service before, before we left. And... Uh, the soldiers kind of, some of them, uh, uh, snickered a little bit, uh, but they got pretty serious. And uh, the chaplain, uh, he was a tremendous guy, and he gave us a tremendous blessing. I think that's what, uh, you know, we believe very, very deep in our religion. And uh, I don't know, I just uh, listened to every word he said. There was some mumbling around and stuff like that, but it was a younger group. And uh, like I say, they didn't take things too serious. But coming out of the Pacific, when I come out of the Pacific, I'd been through a little bit of this stuff. And I was taken a little bit serious. And uh, it was a tremendous blessing. And I really, really appreciated it. Let me, let me 
me ask you another question now. Um, you know, you you were a young man on the beach. I mean, you. When did it dawn on you this wasn't a game? I mean, when that sergeant was hit, was that probably when it dawned no, on you? No, when the three went down okay. in the water. Was it anything like that movie Saving Private Ryan, the first part of that movie? Yeah, the first part. And then it kind of got weak until the very end. And I then I believed, I mean, that's just about the way it would be. Did that bring back memories, though, of Omaha Beach when oh. you saw the beginning of that movie? Yeah, yeah. I, I have... This is, this is the first time I have ever discussed this with my family. Uh, as close as I am to my two sons, I would never, never talk about it. Not to my wife, not to my two sons, because it was something in my mind that I didn't want to ever talk about it again. And I didn't think I'd ever do this. Uh, but I, I really, uh, I didn't think it was as serious as it was. Did you realize the enormity of the invasion at the time? I mean, oh. looking back now, you can see it was the largest invasion we've ever had. Yeah. But at the time, did you know you were making history and that this was... No, this no, was I had no idea I was making history. All I knew was we were fighting for a cause. And that cause was to free our country and keep freedom alive. That's what we all, that's what we were fighting in the Pacific about. And, uh, but to get back to the reality is when we hit that water and my three, our three soldiers were hit and just, Went, they were hit, went down, and the undercurrent just floated them away. And you couldn't see them. It was murky. Uh, now, now, when you were coming in, were you, able, you weren't able to see over the gunwales or where, whatever you were at uh, in the ship? You couldn't see? No, no. Lines. There was, uh, you could see a little bit from where the ramp came up. You could see a little bit over that, but... Not enough because everything was up like this. To me, that would have been a frightening experience oh. of the unknown and hearing all that. Yeah, that. And stuff. To me, I would have been scared. Then. Oh, we were yeah. after, but we weren't. It wasn't as it wasn't as frightening as it was until that ramp dropped down and those three soldiers were killed. And on our way in, uh, other soldiers would just go into the water. And then when we hit the beach, it was really, really a... Uh, uh, it was just a massacre. And I, I felt, I felt when it was over with, I felt so lucky that I was able to walk off of that beach. And I knew there had to be a God somewhere. I know that, uh, like I say, we come from a very religious family. Uh, and I should be more religious today than what I am. <sighs> but I know that God led, led me through this thing. I had an angel sitting on my shoulder or something. I don't know. But it was... It was something that will live in my memory forever. What are your thoughts about D-Day now, looking back 60 years? I mean, tell me about D-Day and how important D-Day was to our country, you know, looking back now. Well, I think, I think Larry, that, uh, that D-Day was meant to be with 
the Nazis, uh, even into to Russia, had all of the, Bal the Balkans and, and France. And they were sending these V1s and V2s into southern England. And if we hadn't been the soldiers that we were, I wouldn't have been a bit surprised to see England go. I wouldn't have been surprised to see the Japanese in the West control all of that part, and we would have been a divided country between Nazism and Japs. And I think that's why when I was drafted, and by the way, my father was a member of the draft board. He was quite an important man in Sparks. And he was going to see that every son that he had was going to go into the service. So five of us did go. Uh, except for Alan, he was given a, a, not a discharge, but a, he was an engineer on the railroad. So they did, did allow him to stay and operate engines. But, uh, geez, you, you, you're so young, you, you don't realize the importance of all of these things until you sit down and you think about it. And that's why I work the way I do, outside. I help Dorothy inside. And it gives me a peace of mind because I can, I can think back and, and never have to worry about me talking to anybody or anything else. And in fact, I, I don't talk to the people around here too much. I'm kind of isolated, I guess, in my thoughts. Tell me, tell me what freedom means to you. I mean, what does freedom mean in light of what you went through and the country as it is now? What does that meaning, uh, word mean to you, freedom? Well, freedom of speech. I think that is something that uh, that we that a good true American uh, believes in our freedom, and. Uh, I think that's why we didn't hesitate in going to war, because our freedom was at stake. And to be able to drive from city to city, or whatever we do, wherever we want to go, we go, but we don't have to show passports or uh, going into the foreign countries we do. but. Uh, we don't have to, if we want to go to Sandy or if we want to go to, to Holiday over across from 45th, we don't have to, we cross it. We don't have to show uh, a pass to get over there. We just go. And that's, to me, what freedom is all about. I just think that uh, I don't know. I. a young person today about freedom, you know, and regarding our country, and because we take it for granted. I mean, what would you right. tell a young person today? Well, watching those those little kids up there on that beach, or on that stand last night, and they telling that story, I think that was great, Larry. I mean, that was teaching kids what freedom is really about. Uh, now, like, the little kids around the neighborhood that'll come down and they want to talk to me. Uh, it, I, I look at him and it runs through my mind. What would it be without freedom? What would these little kids be? And it becomes more and more important, even today. I'm going on 80 years old, a couple of months, and 
I can still remember and appreciate being able to go and come as I dug on well please. Freedom and and, and I talked to these little kids about about uh, school and uh, things like that. Uh, but I uh, I don't know really what I would say unless they ask me, Larry. Well, that's good.